We continue our studies tonight with some of the positive motives for living the Christian life and being sure that we are doing the will of God. We're in the book of Acts. Acts chapter 16, verses 6 through 8. If you have your Bibles and would like to follow along, this is the passage we're looking at. Acts chapter 16, verses actually 6 through 10, not 6 through 8. Acts chapter 16, beginning in verse 6. Now when they had gone throughout Phrygia and the region of Galatia, and were forbidden of the Holy Ghost to preach the word in Asia, after they were come to Mysia, they essayed to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit suffered them not. And they, passing by Mysia, came down to Troas, and a vision appeared to Paul in the night. There stood a man of Macedonia and prayed him, saying, Come over into Macedonia and help us. And after he had seen the vision, immediately we endeavored to go into Macedonia, assuredly gathering that the Lord had called us for to preach the gospel unto them. Amen. Our gracious Heavenly Father, as we once again look at our motivations for doing your will, we pray that you would help us each to honestly and carefully examine why we do the things that we do. Many of the times we do those things merely because it's habitual. We don't even think about it. And Father, many of our habits come from the flesh. Help us to be willing to examine our habits. Many times we do things not merely because they're habit, but because we have made deliberate choices in the past. And rather than changing, we prefer, even though we sense that it is perhaps not right, we continue to do it because we've always done it that way before. Father, we pray that you will help us to examine our own hearts and help us to make choices that relate to what your word commands us to do. Choices that are based on positive motivations, all of which will fall under the rubric of doing all to the glory of God. Father, we pray for your blessings on your word as it goes forth tonight, that it will not return void, but that it will accomplish that which you please, and that it will prosper in the thing whereto you have sent it. For we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. As you know, we've been talking about the will of God and motivations, asking ourselves the question, why am I doing what I am doing? The will of God includes the reasons that we do what we do, not merely the things that we do. We've looked at one positive general motive. We're going to look at a total of seven positive general motives uh, tonight, the Lord willing, that will help us to understand how we can focus in on doing the will of God in the practical areas of life on a daily basis. By way of contrast, we've already looked at some of the false motives, the catch-all false motive, for first evil false motive, was hypocrisy, and most false motives fall under that general category. We'll see that most of the positive motives fall under the category of doing all to the glory of God doing things so that God will be glorified. But the general catch-all for all the false motives is hypocrisy. We saw that included the second evil motive of pride, the third evil motive of covetousness, the fourth evil motive of sloth, the fifth evil motive of anger, the sixth evil motive of gluttony, the seventh evil motive of lust, and the eighth evil motive of envy. And we noted the difference between envy and jealousy. Jealousy wants what somebody else has, but not willing to work for it. Envy is when you want somebody something that someone else has, and if you can't get it, you're going to destroy what they have, so they can't have it either. And we noted that that list of false motives are what are called the seven deadly sins, or the seven mortal sins, capital vices, cardinal vices, all of which are manifested at various times by hypocrisy. We saw that further that those motives are a form of idolatry of self, putting ourselves on the controlling throne of our lives rather than putting God on the controlling throne of our lives. That brought us to what we looked at last week, which was the evil motive number nine, the motive of fear. 
We saw that there are three basic kinds of fear, fear of God, fear of man, and fear of temporal things that threaten our well-being. We asked ourselves the question, am I doing what I am doing out of fear of man, the fear of temporal things, the fear of human responses, or am I doing those things out of the fear of God? If we have fear that is not based on the fear of God, we are not doing the will of God and we are not being moved by divine direction. We notice some various important statistics out of the Bible. The word fear shows up 400 times, exactly 400 times in the Bible. The word afraid shows up 193 times in the Bible. The word fearful shows up 11 times in the Bible. The word terror shows up 29 times in the Bible. And of course there are other related words that would indicate in the passage that someone was afraid and was afraid for the wrong reasons, but just with those four words alone, that's a total of 633 times, which would tell us that fear is one of the most common evil motivations faced by man. Fear is the response that we have when we want to protect ourselves. That's based on self-interest, usually not on interest in others, although that may occur on occasion where we're fearful for the sake of someone else. Fear is the first thing that comes to our mind when we perceive a situation that we think is dangerous. Fear is the natural reaction to the fle of the flesh to self-preservation. We notice that sometimes fear can be good and sometimes it can keep us from doing something stupid, like sticking our hands in the fire. As, although we talked about how even that might be, on occasion, something that we should not fear, and we gave the illustration of Jan Hus and... Uh, Thomas Kramer, men who were burned at the stake. That helped us to see that there were two different sources of fear. The fear of man, which is evil, and the fear of God, which is good. Proverbs 29, 25, the fear of man bringeth, in, bringeth a snare, but whoso putteth his trust in the Lord shall be safe. Or Proverbs 28, 1, the wicked flee when no man pursueth, but the righteous are bold as a lion. They have the fear of God, they're not afraid of that which is surrounding them because their heart is right before the Lord. We saw that 62 times in 25 books of the Bible were commanded with the words, fear not. That shows up those words, fear not, 62 times in 25 different books of the Bible, which should tell us something about our propensity to be fearful. That command, fear not, gives us courage to have the right motive in serving God and responding properly to divine direction. We read many of these in both the Old Testament, beginning with the promise to Abraham in Genesis 15, 1, where God says, Fear not, Abraham, or fear not, Abram. He's not yet gotten his name Abraham. He's still Abram at that point. Moving to the commands in the Gospels to fear not, and then to the commands about not fearing in the epistles and in the book of Revelation. We saw fear not, including fear not to Joseph, fear not to Mary, fear not to Zacharias, the father of John the Baptist, fear not to the angels, of the angels speaking to the shepherds. Fear not the command of Christ to believers, Matthew 10, 28, for example. Fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. That's the fear of God. But don't fear those who can simply kill you. The fear not of the angels to the women at the tomb of the risen Christ told them fear not. Christ said, Fear not to the disciples when he commissioned them as fishers of men, Luke 5.10. And so was also James and John, the sons of Zebedee, which were partners with Simon. And Jesus said unto Simon, Fear not, for from henceforth thou shalt catch men. Christ said, Fear not to the father of the little girl who had died. Several other times when Jesus wanted his disciples to focus on the eternal things rather than the temporal troubles of life, he said, Fear not. Luke 12, 7, But even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not, therefore, ye are of more value than many sparrows. Or Luke 12, 32, Fear not, little flock, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Fear not was spoken prophetically to the faithful Jews who were awaiting the Messiah in John 12, 15. Fear not, daughter of Zion, quoting the book of Zechariah. Behold, thy king cometh, sitting on an ass's colt. Fear not was said to Paul when he looked like his ministry was at an end. And I think there have probably been many preachers throughout the history of the world who looked at their ministry and it looked like it was coming to an end. And they remembered those words to the Apostle Paul when it looked like he was in a terminal situation. 
and they heard the words, Fear not. Saying, Fear not, Paul, thou must be brought before Caesar, and lo, God hath given thee all them that sail with thee. And then we saw, Fear not, to John, when he received the book of Revelation. Revelation 1.17, And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead, and he laid his right hand on me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. It's a rather important command in Scripture. That's why it is said so many times, because by human nature we are a fearful group of people. We always fear what's going on around us. We have that self-preservation interest built in. Instead of learning to walk by faith, learning to trust God for the difficult times of life, our hearts are often filled with fear. We saw that fear will keep you from doing the will of your master. And I think this is a rather important passage. We didn't actually read it last week, but I'd like to read it tonight. It's out of Matthew chapter 25, beginning in verse 24. The wicked servant did not do the will of the master because of fear. Fear will keep you from doing the will of the master. Let me begin reading in verse 24. Then he which had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew thee that thou art an hard man, reaping where thou hast not sown, and gathering where thou hast not strawed. Now listen to the next four words. And I was afraid. This is the guy that buried it in the earth. This is the guy who was immobilized. This is the guy who didn't do anything because he thought it might go wrong. And I was afraid, and went and hid thy talent in the earth. Lo, there thou hast that is thine. Well, I at least kept it from depreciating in value. Hey, do I get a pat on the back for that? I was scared that something might go wrong, and so, so I, just, I just hoarded it. Listen to what Jesus says. His Lord answered and said unto him, Thou wicked and slothful servant, thou knewest that I reap where I sowed not, and gather where I have not strawed. Thou oughtest therefore to have put my money to the exchangers, and then at my coming, I should have received mine own with usury. Take therefore the talent from him, and give it unto him which hath ten talents. For unto every one that hath shall be given, and he shall have abundance. But from him that hath not shall be taken away even that which he hath. And cast ye the unprofitable servant into outer darkness, there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. His only crime was that he was afraid. And yet, what did Jesus call him? He called him wicked, and he called him slothful. He called him unprofitable. Three things that were the practical result of his fear. Did you notice that wickedness and slothfulness are two of the evil false motives that we've studied? Fear is tied to both of them, to wickedness and to slothfulness. God did not give him a pass merely because he was afraid. Fear was an evil motive in this passage that had eternal consequences. I hope that rings some bells with us. You see, fear does not come from God, but fear comes from the world, the flesh, and the devil. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7 and 8. For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power, and of love, and of a sound mind. Did you realize that fear destroys all three of those things? 
The first thing that fear destroys is power. That's what happened to this man here in this passage that Jesus gives the illustration of the man with the talent. It incapacitated him. He lost his ability to do. God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power. Fear negates power. Did you notice that the second thing that it negates is love? If you have the spirit of fear, it means that you do not have the spirit of love. That is a serious indictment against many Christians. Rather than having a love for God which motivates them to do in spite of what the circumstances suggest, instead of loving their fellow man, their fear controls them to love themselves alone. God hath not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love. Do you know the third thing that's listed here that fear will destroy in your life? It's a sound mind. You will not be able to function rationally. Fear will always remove the sound mind. Did you notice that's what happened to the man in the passage here? The Lord answered and said unto him, You knew that I reap where I sowed not, and gather where I have not strawed. He didn't think clearly about what would be the consequences of failing to do what the Master told him to do. He did not do the will of the Master because he was afraid. He lost his sound mind. Now let me read that verse in the context of the very next verse and that will perhaps set it in perspective for us. 2 Timothy 1, 7 and 8 For God hath not given us the spirit of fear but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Very next verse. Be not thou for, therefore, ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me his prisoner, but be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God. What is Paul telling Timothy? Did you notice the statement is in the context of witnessing? It's in the context of sharing the gospel? It's in the context of being a partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God. God hath not given us the spirit of fear. That's in the context of witnessing. Fearing is the principal thing that keeps us from telling other people about Jesus Christ. We could spend a long time on that. We're not going to, but I think you get the point. We also noted in closing last week that we could talk about many other evil motivations. Things like apparently insurmountable odds instead of walking by faith. The evil motivation of saying, I'm too exhausted instead of waiting on the Lord and renewing our strength and mounting up with wings as eagles and running and not be weary and walking and not fainting. We talk about the motive of being overwhelmed, or so we think, instead of keeping our eyes on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. There are many others. For example, personal peace, personal comfort as our motivations, personal affluence. You know, one about personal comfort is really a big one here in America. If it's not comfortable, we don't want to do it. You know, the scripture says, Forsake not the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is, and so much the more as ye see the day approaching. A time of judgment was coming. It does not say, Forsake not the assembling of yourselves together except when it is cold. <laughs> Empty pews speak volumes when the weather gets cold. One of our motivations is personal comfort. That's one of the motivations that we all have. The question is, will it overcome the commands of Scripture and the will of God for our lives? You know, the Russian Christians, especially during 
the era from Lenin and Stalin and down to the present time have had to endure great discomfort of cold. I've shown you some of the films on our watch night services about Christians in Russia who have had to meet out in the woods in the snow in the dead of winter in temperatures that get far colder than anything that we've ever experienced here in the United States. And yet they did it because they loved the Lord Jesus Christ and they loved the fellowship of believers. And they knew that their command was to meet together and worship together and they found strength in that. And they found encouragement in that and they found real comfort, not the temporal comforts of the warm buildings. They met there because Jesus had told them to do so. You think of the Chinese Christians today who meet in some of the most uncomfortable circumstances imaginable, traveling huge long distances by walking, by public transportation, on bicycles, in some very inconvenient and out of the way locations. You saw the film, if you were with us, Bamboo in Winter. You saw the way that they suffer and are deprived of their comforts merely because they want to serve Christ. Dear people, here in America, that motivation may soon be destroyed for us as our comforts are taken away. Personal peace, personal comfort, personal affluence. Each of those cases, the source of motivation is not from God. No, the source of evil motivation is the world, the flesh, the devil, the demons. And with that motivation coming from God and those four motivations, those are the only five possible sources of motivation available to the human race. God provides all the good sources of motivation. The other four motivations are from a different source. We noted that all the sins listed in Proverbs 6 can be traced back to one of those roots. We noted that all the sins listed in Galatians chapter 5, verses 19 through 21, the works of the flesh, can be traced back to one of those roots. Now that brings us to tonight, to positive motivations. We've already seen the underlying first positive motivation for doing the will of God, do all to the glory of God. All of the other positive motivations stem from this, just like the false motives, are attached to hypocrisy. And so we come to the second positive motivation in scripture, which is heavenly rewards. The second positive motivation for doing the will of God is heavenly rewards. Everything that you want to get a reward for when you stand before Christ. And wanting heavenly rewards is a valid motive. Colossians chapter 3, verse 23 and following. And whatsoever ye do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto men, knowing that of the Lord ye shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for ye serve the Lord Christ. But he that doeth wrong shall receive for the wrong which he hath done, and there is no respect of persons. False motives do not receive a heavenly reward. Positive motives receive a heavenly reward. We should certainly want to receive those rewards when we stand before Christ. Or how about 1 Corinthians chapter 3, beginning in verse 9? For we are laborers together with God. Ye are God's husbandry. Ye are God's building. According to the grace of God, which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereon. So all of us pay attention to this, Paul says. I lay the foundation, and he tells you in the next verse what that foundation is. I'm the wise master builder. I've, I've set the stage. He's the one that wrote those books that are scripture that we are to listen to, that we are to heed because it's the word of God through Paul. Let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. He laid the foundation for us here. Now, if any man build upon this foundation, and you folks and I, we are all building on that foundation. If you're a Christian, you are in fact building on that foundation. The question is, what are you building? What are the building materials that you are using? Is it junk or is it good? If any man build upon this foundation, gold, silver, precious stones, 
And then he gives you the contrast, wood, hay, stubble. Every man's work shall be made manifest. You know, there's a visible manifestation of our faith. It's the works that we do. We've talked about what is a good work in the eyes of God. What are the character qualities of a good work? What things are good in God's eyes and what things are not good? We'll not go over that again tonight. I hope you remember it. Every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it. In other words, you're not going to get around the corner on this one. You can't hide out behind somebody else on this one. You can't just sort of avoid appearing on this one. The day shall declare it because it shall be revealed by fire. The wicked are going to be cast into fire forever. But did you know our works are going to pass through the fire too? It says so here. Every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. What's it made out of? It may like look good on the surface, but the question is, what is it made out of? Fire tests things. Are they consumable, or are they refinable? Fire puts it to the test. Certain things burn, certain things don't burn. If any man's work abide, which he hath built thereupon, now get the next five words, he shall receive a reward. That's a positive motivation. A positive motivation for doing the will of God. A positive motivation for giving a visible manifestation through our works through what takes place in our life, a visible manifestation to the world around us that we have genuine faith. You heard me preach on that on Reformation Sunday. He shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. You see, the foundation is Jesus Christ. The foundation will not burn. If you have the right foundation, you're saved. But you're building on that foundation. What are you building with? We should have the motive of wanting to receive heavenly rewards and then tailoring the things that we do in life so that they will indeed meet <coughs> the qualifications of works that are pleasing to God. Because it is for those things that we receive a heavenly reward. The third positive motive is wanting to please, to do things that please the Lord. Pleasing Christ. And by the way, I should mention, that has some very positive, practical results. Proverbs 16, 7 gives us some of those. For example, when a man's ways please the Lord, he maketh even his enemies to be at peace with him. That's a prayer that I pray every morning. Lord, help my ways to please you so that my enemies will be at peace with me. We all have enemies. Do you know how to control the enemies so that they will be at peace with you? When a man's ways please the Lord, that should be a very positive motive. When a man's ways please the Lord, he maketh even his enemies to be at peace with him. I've been reading through the Old Testament in my morning devotions and looking at some of the kings and noting that when the various kings, and it gives you commentary to this effect, when their ways pleased the Lord, they had peace in Judah or peace in Israel. As long as their ways pleased the Lord. As soon as their ways did not please the Lord, he raised up enemies against them. There's the practical statement of that. One of our motives should be to please the Lord because he will, in fact, make our enemies to be at peace with us. Are we surrounded by enemies? Do the enemies seem to be coming in like a flood? Does there seem to be a situation in the United States with infiltration from foreign lands? The ways of the Christians, are they pleasing to the Lord? As you look at the church in general, 
Their positive practical results for wanting to please the Lord. Psalm 69, verses 30 through 32. I will praise the name of God with a song and will magnify him with thanksgiving. This also shall please the Lord. That is, praising the name of God with song, magnifying him with thanksgiving. Is your life filled with thanksgiving or complaint? This also shall please the Lord better than an ox or bullock that hath horns and hooves. That's better than bringing animal sacrifices. Praising God with a song, magnifying him with thanksgiving. And there's a practical result to that. Verse 32. The humble shall see this and be glad, and your heart shall live that seek God. Practical results of wanting to please the Lord in all that we do. You know, that motive of pleasing the Lord affects everything, even how we view the wonderful blessing of marriage. I can remember when I was still single, years and years and years ago, it's a long time ago, but going through high school and college and worrying about would I ever got, get a chance to get married. I'm thankful God let me get married. There's, there are a lot of things you learn in marriage where you get a lot of rough edges knocked off you that you wouldn't learn any other way. Some folks never get that privilege. But you know, that motive of pleasing the Lord affects even how we view the wonderful blessing of marriage. Listen to 1 Corinthians 7, verses 32 through 34. But I would have you without carefulness. Now that's in the context of being worried about getting married. He that is unmarried careth for the things that belong to the Lord, how he may please the Lord. You know, I had to finally give that worry up and focus on pleasing the Lord. And that's when God brought Judy into my life. I would have you to be without carefulness, that is, without worrying about getting married. He that is unmarried careth for the things that belong to the Lord, how he may please the Lord. But he that is married careth for the things that are of the world, how he may please his wife. There is a difference also between a wife and a virgin. The unmarried woman careth for the things of the Lord, how that she may be holy both in body and in spirit. But she that is married careth for the things of the world, how she may please her husband. There are some positive benefits to being single. Paul is listing them here because at Corinth, sex was a big thing. I mean, it was like the central focus of everybody in town. To Corinthianize meant to be a fornicator. They were overwhelmed with sexual imagery in that city and sexual desires and sexual motivations. And Paul deals with a lot of that in 1 Corinthians. It describes our culture here in the United States of America and the church has been affected by that culture. And Paul is reminding them that if you're single, it gives you a tremendous opportunity for focusing on things that please the Lord. Since I've become widowed, it has refocused me on that area. How I may please the Lord. The unmarried woman careth for the things of the Lord. And here are the things that she focuses on. How that she may be holy, both in body and in spirit. Much to learn under this third positive motive of wanting to do things that please the Lord. It has practical effect on how we live our lives. And that's what brings us to the next positive result of that motive of wanting to do things that please the Lord. That motive affects how we live the Christian life free from the entanglements of the world in two beneficial areas. Number one, spiritual bounty. And number two, spiritual victory. Pleasing the Lord and related to spiritual bounty. Listen to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 1. Furthermore, then, we beseech you, brethren, and exhort you by the Lord Jesus, that as ye have received of us, now get this next phrase, how ye ought to walk, that's the Christian life, 
and to please God. And here's the results. So you would abound more and more. Spiritual bounty comes from walking the Christian life in a manner that pleases the Lord. So you would abound more and more. It also relates to spiritual victory. Listen to 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 4. No man that warreth, and you are in a war, and so am I. No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life. Listen to the next part. That he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. Is your desire in your spiritual warfare to please the Lord? Because he has chosen you to be a soldier. It tells us no man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life. We have spiritual victory as we focus on pleasing the Lord. He brings it about in our spiritual warfare that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. Let me give you another practical application of this particular motive of pleasing God, an application for children and employees. Did you know that obedience pleases God, but sassing those in authority does not please God? Titus chapter 2, verse 9. Exhort servants to be obedient unto their own masters, and to please them well in all things, not answering again. Our job is to please our employer, and as we do so, we please God. Christ himself is our principal example of pleasing the Heavenly Father. Listen to John chapter 8, verse 29. And he that sent me is with me. The Father hath not left me alone. Now listen to the next. It gives you a four that means because. He that sent me is with me. The Father hath not left me alone. For I do always those things that please him. Did Jesus ever do anything that was not pleasing to the Heavenly Father? No. I think you'd agree. Jesus never did anything that was not pleasing to the Heavenly Father. Is Jesus our example? Yes. He's our principal example of doing everything that pleases the Father. Even things that are difficult? Yes. Even things that result in the scorn and mockery of other people? Yes. Even testifying to the truth when people oppose us and call us blasphemers? Yes. Even in a situation of suffering to the point of being beaten and stripped naked and hung on a cross and killed? Yes. For I do always those things that please him. We think too much of our personal peace and comfort and affluence. Christ is our principal example. That moves us to the fourth positive motive. The fourth positive motive is desiring to be spirit controlled and not flesh controlled. Obviously, our motives and our actions should never be controlled by the flesh because that is always a guarantee that we are outside of the will of God. A few verses. Romans chapter 8, verse 8. So then, they that are in the flesh, get the next three words, cannot, not sometimes don't, they that are in the flesh cannot please God. If you're walking in the flesh, can you please God? No. If you're walking in the flesh, can you do the will of God? No. How about Galatians chapter 5, verse 16? We should be controlled by the Spirit rather than by the flesh. This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. We should be motivated by the desire to be controlled by the Spirit of God and not by the flesh. 
You've heard me preach in the past on Romans chapter 6 and Romans chapter 12. Two different issues are being discussed in those two different chapters. In Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, Paul deals with the one-time presentation of your body as a living sacrifice. And it has continuing results and eternal consequences. Present your body a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service, and be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. That's clearly a verse that deals with the will of God. If you haven't done Romans 12, you will not be doing the will of God. Your motives will all be tainted by something. If you've never presented your body as a living sacrifice, that's a once and for all presentation. It occurs once in your life, if you've done it. It is separate from salvation. It is where you decide, I'm going to present my body to Christ so that I live for him regardless of the consequences. I did that many, many years ago as a child when I understood that passage. I didn't know the Greek. I didn't know that it was an aorist tense at that point, which is a punctiliar action that has continuing results. I didn't know all that stuff. I didn't learn those things until I got into college and started studying Greek. Actually, I started Greek in seventh grade, but I didn't learn all those neat grammar things until I got later. I just started to learn to read it. My dad taught me. If you've never done that, folks, you will not be walking in the will of God. Because, you see, you need to present your body as a living sacrifice. Your body is what expresses you to the world around you. I beseech you, therefore, brethren. He begs them to do it. He's writing to Christians. He's writing one of the most powerful doctrinal epistles in the New Testament. There are people who already know a lot of theology, but he's begging them to do something. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, they're already saved, they're brethren, that you present your bodies as living sacrifices. A sacrifice gets put on an altar. We keep trying to crawl off the altar. It's a reasonable request that is made. Have you done it so that your body, every part of it, belongs to Christ? That's Romans 12. Romans chapter 6 is what we're dealing with here, this fourth motive of desiring to be spirit-controlled and not flesh-controlled. That also involves some positive choices that you make on a daily basis. Romans chapter 6 is a repetitive thing that takes place where each day you present the members of your body as members of instruments of righteousness. Where you say, Lord, today I want to make sure that each of my members, which is going to express you to the world around me, is yielded to the Spirit of God. The eyes that look at the wrong things. The ears that listen to the wrong things. The mouth that says the wrong things. The hands that touch the wrong things. And if you sniff glue, the nose that smells the wrong things. You yield your members. You don't insist on using the way your flesh wants to use them. Do you do that on a daily basis? What about your internal members like your mind? You yield to the thoughts of Christ, bringing every thought into captivity to Christ, to the obedience of Christ. Do you do that on a daily basis? Proverbs 16 says that as you commit your works unto the Lord, your thoughts will be established. You don't commit the thoughts first to the Lord and hope the works get established. You commit your works to the Lord and your thoughts get established.
That's a very powerful motivation. Desiring to be controlled by the Spirit of God and not controlled by the flesh. About Galatians chapter 5, verse 25. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Just like a fish lives in water, and the fish has no desire to get out of water and crawl on land like the evolutionary model about some fish that years ago decided there wasn't enough to eat in the ocean, and so it walked out on land and started to breathe air. But what a bizarre fairy tale. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. The fifth positive motive, and I think one of the most powerful and important, the fifth positive motive is love. Love that results in joyful, selfless giving. In other words, personal sacrifice out of love for others, not selfishness. Now, I've also already talked about loving God, and that's why we do things to the glory of God. Because we love Him, we want to please Him. I'm talking about love for others. Love that results in joyful, selfless giving. Sacrificial love for others, not selfishness for ourselves. Let me give you some verses on that. Romans chapter 15, verse 1. We then that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak. Now listen to the last five words. And not to please ourselves. Our love for others should overcome that selfish motivation of pleasing ourself. How about Romans 15 too? Let every one of us please his neighbor for his good to edification. It will cost you something to do that. You're doing something for your neighbor. You're doing it for his good. You're doing it for his edification, even if it costs you something. That is, for his building up. That's what the word edification means. How about 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 33? Even as I please all men in all things, not seeking mine own profit, but the profit of many. And Paul, as an evangelist, adds these words, that they may be saved. Hey, he says, I didn't go into the evangelistic crusade business so I could make a lot of money like a lot of the popular evangelists of history have done. And they hold their crusades and they take their big offerings and they smack people on the forehead and slay them in the spirit and drop blankets over them for modesty's sake. They get the people speaking in tongues. I think I told you one situation years and years ago. I was with my brother and sister. We were traveling on a um, visit to 40 different churches out throughout the West Coast. Uh, Midwest to the West, we stopped at 40 different churches and put on concerts. I played the piano, my brother played the cello, my sister played the viola, my brother sang. We put on concerts representing my father's radio broad broadcast, The Word of Grace. And the concerts were lined up by the secretary, who didn't know anything about the churches where we were going. It's simply that Dad had announced it over his radio program that um, we would be traveling that summer. We were trying to line up an itinerary, which churches would like for us to come. And um, so the various churches wrote in and they requested that we stop at their church. Would it fit into the schedule? And so they were lined up on different dates as we traveled all over the United States. And in a basically two and a half month period, we did 40 concerts. And then I would preach. We got to this one place out in California. We looked at the name of it and it sounded kind of strange, but it's called The Lord's Church. Okay, Lord's Church. We looked for the address and we didn't have GPS's back in those days. You simply had to use a map and find your way there. And you hoped that the streets had numbers on them so that you could tell what block you were in. This is out in California, one of the big cities out in California. We drove up and down the street. We couldn't figure out where it was because as best we could tell, the only thing at that location was a movie theater. So uh, we finally stopped and we pulled into the parking lot there and we walked up and the big marquee is hanging out over the sidewalk and 
as we walked under the marquee, there was this funny racket coming out of the speakers on the marquee. So we went in, and it turned out that was choir practice. <laughs> I suppose a lot of churches have choir practices that have funny sounding racket, but this was really funny sounding racket. And there they were up on the stage, wiggling around and waving their hands and doing all kinds of stuff. Our, I'm thankful our choir doesn't do that. And um, turned out it was a charismatic church. We were scheduled to s sing there that evening. And um, so we uh, set up, and we did a little bit of practice, and thought, boy, our music is certainly not like the stuff that these people are singing. Service got going, and uh, oh, the pastor did all kinds of funny things, like when it came time for the offering, you know, he says, uh, now, if you're going to give $100, stand up. If you're going to give $50, stand up. If you give $25, stand up, and so on. And then when he got through down to the dollar level, he finally said, now, you know if your neighbor didn't stand up, and if they didn't stand up, turn and give them a dirty look. <laughs> hmm. I thought, I don't think I want any of this offering. But afterwards, they took us back to the back to watch them count the offering. And um, one of the deacons took my brother aside to try to convince him that we ought to learn to speak in tongues. And the pastor's daughter took my sister aside and tried to convince her of the same thing. And the pastor cornered me. And he said, um, you know, um, you really need to get your people speaking in tongues. And uh, it's really important. So I went through all the reasons from Scripture why the gift of tongues was a temporary gift and why it had ceased. And I said, Pastor so-and-so, you, you've been to seminary. I mean, I can see that here on your resume. You've been to seminary. Uh, didn't you learn those things? And he says, well, yes, I know that's what it says. But if you want to get them to open their wallets and donate money, you get them speaking in tongues because that gets them emotionally involved. And I thought, you heretic. You're in this for the money. Exactly contrary to what we see here in 1 Corinthians 10, 33. Even as I please all men in all things, not seeking mine own profit. Not seeking mine own profit. Paul was an evangelist. But the profit of many that they may be saved. Not so that I can control them and get money out of their pockets. That fifth motive is a powerful motive, that motive of love for others that results in joyful, selfless giving, personal sacrifice for others, not selfishness. I should pause and put one caveat in here at this point. Our motive to help our neighbor must not be in conflict with the motive of pleasing Christ. Let me give you an example. For example, you must not give money to an alcoholic who will then go out and spend it on booze. I mean, here's a neighbor, here's one that you want to help, but the way to help him is not give him money so that he spends it on booze. Galatians 1.10, For do I now persuade men or God? Do I seek to please men? For if I yet please men, I should not be the servant of Christ. He tells us in Romans that we're supposed to please our neighbor, but here he tells us we don't please men because it will keep us from being the servant of Christ. You cannot put those two motives in conflict one with another. That brings us to the sixth positive motive, and we're running out of time here, so let me move through the last two quickly. The sixth positive motive is the deliberate, thoughtful avoidance of sin. Motive number six, the deliberate, thoughtful avoidance of sin. And anything that is sin does not please God. I'll give you an illustration of that. First Thessalonians 2.15. The Apostle Paul, talking about the Jews, it says, who both killed the Lord Jesus and their own prophets and have persecuted us, and they please not God and are contrary to all men. The deliberate thoughtful avoidance of sin. They obviously were not having a deliberate thoughtful avoidance of sin, and therefore they did not please God. Many illustrations of that, but I think that's a simple enough one to figure out. Number seven. The seventh and final positive motive is wanting to walk by faith. 
it's not just a matter of falling into the walk of faith. It's a matter of earnestly desiring to walk by faith. I think that's a key motive, just like doing everything to the glory of God. And that walk of faith is clearly a motive that pleases God. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is the rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Isn't that interesting? That ties us back in with that first new motive that we looked at tonight, the desire for rewards. Without faith it's impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and, not really believe that he is, and that he is the rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Do you have that as a positive motive in your life? The earnest desire to want to walk by faith. If you do, God will give you the opportunity. He'll put you to the test. He'll put you in a situation where you can either walk by sight or you can walk by faith. And walking by faith is sometimes very uncomfortable. Because we like to know where we're going and we, we feel our way with our feet and we look with our eyes and we touch with our hands and, and we want to see if it's really there or do we really have to trust God. If God sees in your heart the earnest desire to walk by faith, he's going to give you the opportunity to walk by faith and then see if you will walk by faith or if you'll still go stumbling along by sight. But as you walk by faith, not only does your life fill with joy and peace and with confidence, it gives you a greater faith to realize that God is there. God cares about you as an individual. God is there to take care of you because you are trusting him. The motives that God finds positive motives that we might live a life that is pleasing to him. Our gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you once again for your word and for its power, for the privilege of looking into scripture again tonight to test our motives, to see if they are motives that please you, motives that are in obedience to your word, motives that give glory to God, motives that are connected to faith, motives that are controlled by the Spirit of God, not controlled by the flesh, motives that stem from a heart filled with love for you and love for the brethren. Help us, Father, to have motives that we clearly and thoughtfully and deliberately avoid sin, so that when we stand before our Lord Jesus Christ, we can hear him say, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord, and not to be like that wicked and slothful servant who is motivated by fear and his motivation also had not only loss of what he had, but it had eternal consequences as well. If we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing hymn for tonight is hymn number 402, Trust and Obey. I think that's my